Good morning, everyone. How wonderful to have this early morning crowd out in Northwest Washington. Thank you for coming, and you won't be disappointed for, for joining us for this Smart Women, Smart Power event, where we are welcoming House Appropriations Chairwoman Nita Lowy and Ranking Member Kay Granger for a conversation about foreign aid and international affairs spending. I'm Kathleen Hicks. I direct the International Security Program here, and along with Beverly Kirk, we have the honor of overseeing the Smart Women, Smart Power Program which is an effort to amplify the voices of women on issues related to national security, international aid, development, and other related issues, international business as well. And we're so lucky to have a sponsor in City, and I want to open up by asking Kristen Solheim from City to come forward and say a few words before I introduce the Congresswoman. Thanks, Kath. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a, it's a real honor to be here this morning for another wonderful um, series in the Smart Women, Smart Power um, series. We're blessed to have two women on stage that have um, come a long way and understand the essential role that women play, not only in, in policy, but in the power of the purse strings leading the Appropriations Committee. So it's pretty exciting to have both of them here. They both have an amazing and distinctive career in Congress, and it's this Congress that they really made history together. Um, I'm not sure if this is true, but the last time two women led a House committee was 42 years ago, and it was the Select Committee on the House Beauty Shop. Is that true? We've come a long way. Uh, city is present in more than 100 countries, and we talk a lot about the, the advantage this gives us, not only in business, but in our worldview. It gives us a lot of opportunities to see the challenges and struggles that people have around the world. And this is one forum that we think we can bring a lot of um, smart conversation to the, the challenges that people all around the world, including the United States, face on a daily basis. So we're really proud to be here. Love seeing a full room this early in the morning. And please enjoy the conversation. Thank you. Let me say just a few final words of introduction. We have as our moderator this morning the great Nina Easton, um, who is a senior associate here at CSIS. Uh, please make sure if you're uh, tweeting, and we hope you are, that you're using our, our um, Twitter handle, which is at SmartWomen, and hashtag CSIS Live uh, for live tweeting from the event. And let me finally just add a few of the firsts, because I think the, the members are well known to everyone. But just as a reminder, uh, Chairwoman Lowy was the first woman to chair the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. She's also the first woman to chair the House Appropriations Committee. Um, Ranking Member Granger was the first and only Republican woman to represent Texas in the House of Representatives. Prior to that, she was the first woman mayor of Fort Worth, Texas, and the first female chair of the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee. So it's just an amazing set of careers. Um, to talk through today and over to Nina. One housekeeping <coughs> question. The lights um, seem brighter than usual and they're right in these women's faces. Correct. So if there's any way to turn down those super bright lights, it might make our guests a little bit more comfortable. I know we have TV cameras, but um, I thought. Uh, so welcome everybody. Thank you so much for, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, good. My guests, thank you. Um, thank you so much for turning out this morning. And uh, I, as always, we want to put in a plug for the Smart Women, Smart Power podcast, hosted by um, Bev Kirk in the back. Uh, and I also, as a housekeeping note, I want to encourage you. This is interactive. We want to include all of you. So please be sure to jot down your questions. And we will be coming around to collect them. And just a few minutes in, we'll start asking those questions. So please go ahead and, and um, think about what you want to talk about. So let's start with, you know, in these divided times and difficult times in this city, we have two women here representing two different part, uh, parties running probably the most, one of the most important committees in the House. Talk about how you work together and get things done. Start with you, Congressman Granger. It's really pretty simple. Uh, we both respect each other. Uh, we're friendly in a very professional way. And, and the most important thing is we want to make things happen. And so we start with that. 
how do we get to the right position, uh, do it together with mutual respect, and take on important issues. That's my position. And you also talked backstage about traveling together is we an have. important way to We've do that. We've traveled to, to countries together. And I said, I just, I don't know how you make the right decisions if you really haven't seen, if you've just read about it. But if you go there, and we've gone to some, some very, very dangerous places, difficult places, we come away with a, a much clearer idea of really what's going on. And I think that's very important. You just can't do it well if you just read about it uh, in a staff report, I don't think. And Congressman Lowy, talk about how you work together beyond and beyond beauty shops. Um, how do women, <laughs> do women cross party lines on the Hill better? Possibly? I wish they did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say, I think the most important thing is mutual respect. First of all, as you know, the parties have switched control of the House. So sometimes Kay is chair, sometimes I'm chair. I understand the issues that she can't compromise on. And she understands the issues that I can't compromise on. So when I'm in charge, she gets it. <laughs> when she's in charge, I get it. And we make our views heard. Um, but it's much rather to be better to be chair than ranking. On, is <laughs> on issues mm -hmm. like health care and choice, uh, it's better to be the chair if this is what you are passionate about. And what about global education for girls and women? That's something that you've been a leader on. You're retiring. Some people worry that about what's going to happen to that, that level of spending. Talk about what you've done and where you see that going. I am so glad you mentioned it because I am passionate about educating not just boys. We don't want them running around the streets either, but girls as well. And you see the difference. We have both been to Afghanistan, and I am really worried about what the future will be because a million girls in school, girls' schools being built, the girls have a voice, they speak up, they're part of the government, and it has been a priority to me as far back as I can remember, I think even before I became chair or ranking of the Foreign Ops Subcommittee, you see that it, it is so clear. I wish more people can actually see it. And I want to talk about boys' education, too, because if they're not in school, they're running around causing trouble on the streets and organizing or being part of gangs. And for girls, they can stand taller. I can think of specific examples where they went out and they worked after their education. And they wouldn't let others just push them around because they knew that they had a right and a role in their communities. So education, girls and boys, is absolutely critical. And I want to get back to Kay on that, but just on, in Afghanistan, and it's interesting you brought that up because that's a country that's going through um, you know, a new chapter. How do you think that will, the fact that you have these more educated girls now, how is that going to affect how things play out in Afghanistan? Well, I think an educated girl understands that when she is a woman and she uh, can run for office, be part of the government, she has control over what's happening in our community, in her community. But I am very, very concerned. You've already seen some schools blown up. And I am not going to discuss today the number of troops, but we clearly have to maintain a presence in Afghanistan to preserve so many of our accomplishments. The girls or women have come here to the United States. They've talked with our colleagues. They express to us the importance of education. So education, and then when they grow up to be women, they will have a role, a voice in what's happening in their government. So I think it's essential to keep investing in education and preserving those schools that we work so hard to build. Okay, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, the best e experience I had, um, have had is working with the women of Iraq. When we went into Iraq, President Bush asked me to put together a group of women members and work with the women of Iraq. Of, of Iraq. I, I didn't know 
the, all the history about Iraq. But the women of Iraq at one time had more freedom than any of the women in that entire region. And when Saddam Hussein came in power, he, he pushed all of that down. He said, we, that's not what we want. So many of those women left the country. They went left and walked away. When they understood that we, meaning the United States, was trying to help them and, and give them freedoms and make changes, they came back, so many of them came back to Iraq and said, we want to be a part of that. So I put together a group and, and made numerous trips back and forth to Iraq, meeting with women who were completely clothed in black. All I could see were their eyes. They wouldn't speak to me, but they would tell someone else who would then tell me. In some cases would leave notes, I can't speak because my life would be in danger, but I want you to know this. And these women who had been, lived in Iraq, who had been attorneys and physicians and had, had careers and put all that together. It was the greatest learning experience for me. Uh, but when you saw the difference in those women who had been educated, who had freedoms, it was really astounding. And that's what the president was saying when he said, when the hearts and minds, he meant of the women. And so knowing, having that experience, then going into areas where uh, Peru, for instance, where there, the women, very few were educated, very few had careers or freedoms. I think we, we both understand how real, the enormous difference in those women and their children. Same question to you about Afghanistan. How do you, how do you see that playing out? And um, I know you're, you're, on, you're on the money side of it, the funding right. troops side of it. Mm -hmm. What's your perspective on I that? I think we have, to st we have to stay and help them uh, be safe as long as we can and help them encourage the, that country and what, what, what they can be. Uh, and I think that's part of our responsibility. Let's turn more generally to foreign aid. What is your perspective on the importance of foreign aid as part as a tool in our kit for foreign policy? It's, it's extremely important. And foreign aid is so, the, the definitions, the way it works out in different countries is so different. Um, it's, I know Mrs. Lilly and I both had the same thing. We have to convince people, this is what we're doing for tonight. This is where it's going. For instance, the Northern Triangle, how important that is. But we had to remind this president and say, we wrote into those bills for funding that it's not to go to those governments. The governments were very corrupt. It's going to contractors that are, that are helping people in those countries and will make the difference in those young people. But when we're talking about foreign assistance, um, we, there's all sorts of foreign assistance. I see where it works the best, where we say, we want to help you. This is your goal. We want to help you with that goal. But there are certain responsibilities that are yours uh, in exchange for what we're doing there. Um, and let me ask the same question of you, foreign aid. Um, you know, the public typically thinks we spend a lot more on foreign aid than we do. One percent. Um, it's one percent. So how do you get that message out? Well, I think the best way to get it out, and I'm, I won't say that we're that successful mm -hmm. getting it out, because the majority of the public still does not support foreign aid, which is unfortunate. But I think it makes much more sense to invest in schools and health care rather than bullets and guns and blowing communities up. And an educated population, in my judgment, is less likely to turn to guns. Now, there are huge challenges. I remember when I first met Ashraf Ghani, who was an activist at the UN, and he became head uh, of the government Afghanistan. in Afghanistan. And I had all kinds of hopes. I really thought this was a change. But sometimes the forces of opposition are so strong that even an educated, committed, determined leader cannot be, cannot always be successful. But we can't give up because I think it's so important, especially I'll mention Afghanistan again, when you see these young women who've gotten an education and are now being part of the government, 
hopefully we'll have a woman in charge in Afghanistan one of these days and maybe see some major change. But the forces of um, opposition are so strong in some countries because of hundreds, maybe thousands of years of tradition that even investing in education and health care, um, you have to keep at it. We can't give up. We've been honored, by the way, to have the First Lady of Afghanistan on this very stage. Um, she's, she's quite impressive. Kay, do you see, where do you see the role of the private sector in foreign aid, and do you, do you think it feel, fills gaps that the government uh, oh, I think it absolutely does, and, and it also spreads the responsibility. The government's not, not in charge of everything, even our government. So I think it's very important. One of the aspects of helping women all over the world is helping women support themselves. And so when we say, I'll never forget uh, a trip um, to Central America, and there were some areas that we went to in Central and South America who were farmers. And when we started helping them spray the plants because they were growing marijuana, and said, what do we do? We're the farmers. So we came in and said, here, let's help you. And one situation said, if you can grow marijuana, you can grow coffee. So I'll never forget, in, a, in the jungle, a woman bringing her, her a bowl of coffee beans to be tested. Were these, were these beans of a quality that you can be part of the economy as a farmer? And so there are all sorts of ways. And when, when women succeed, their children are more apt to succeed. And it opens up a whole different a different situation. I think that's very important. The private sector can be very involved in that because it's not our government that's going to buy that coffee. It's going to be the private sector. And so we invited them in to come in and help these farmers and say, this is the way to produce in a way that you can sustain your, your country's economy and your family. You so. know, there are, I have to add to that because there are so many wonderful examples. I remember going to Tanzania and Landa Lakes partnered with us and with other local organizations. And they created a cheese factory. And these women who had never worked before just stood taller and they were so proud of themselves. And it affected their family life and their professional life to be able to work, to earn money, to take care of the family, in some cases in partnership with the husband, in some case without the husband. Uh, but it was a very exciting example of what can be done with a partnership between the private sector and the U.S. government. Well, what's, the, what's the limitation on, when, you, when you look at um, not just like Land O'Lakes and, and um, Fortune 500 corporations that I work with, but um, the Gates Foundation, or these, these who have been very innovative thinkers when it comes to foreign aid, private foreign aid, and bringing big solutions. Is there a limit to what government can actually accomplish with foreign Maybe aid? Maybe there's an imp a, 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 that government should accomplish. In other words, if we take over and say, we're, we know everything. The Gates Foundation, when I came in, uh, the times that I was chair, uh, for Mrs. Lowy was chair when we first started working together. I became chair, she became chair. But, but Bill Gates called and asked to, to come meet with me. And he wanted to show, talk about all that the Gates Foundation did, where they put their money, why they put their money that way, uh, what the goals were. It was very, very extensive. We've met several times. But on the Gates Foundation, the research they were doing to decide where to go and how to approach a particular part of the world. Frankly, we're so much better than what we were doing that we started, start, said if we could team up, if that's what where we can move so quickly and we can team up and go the same area with our funding too, you can get there in half the time. So foundations like that, Bono does a great job with his output, but, but the Gates Foundation does work here in the United States, but the work they do worldwide, and a lot of that work is aimed at helping women, for sure. Yeah, Anita, is there a limit to, again, to well, what government he, can accomplish? Uh, I don't know that there's a limit, but the partnership certainly helps, because there are some 
executives in our government who think you should be putting less money into foreign aid. Some are more generous partners. If you look back in history, I can remember George Bush. And George Bush became such a strong supporter of approaching HIV AIDS. In fact, Bono took him around the world. Ten shows you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I remember talking to Bono before the trip and after the trip. He was so persuasive. And if you talk to President George W. Bush now, he will say his most successful uh, issue in a really approaching a problem and dealing with the problem was with HIV AIDS. And it was because of the partnership with Bono. And they flew around the world looking at projects. And he became a real advocate. And that's, you know, President Bush viewed PEPFAR as a national security issue as that's much right. as a just a foreign aid. We're not just being uh, helpful to other communities. In fact, we're, being, we're protecting our own national interests. Is that? Absolutely. And, and more than any other president, that I've worked with was so involved in that and said, we don't want to use our foreign aid to say, we're going to give you so much money and you so much money. How can we help them help themselves? And the one I remember the most was the project uh, in Peru. And this is the way we approached it said, you have some needs. We'd like to help you with your needs, but you have to prove that you'll help yourself. They had the highest maternal mortality in the world, in Peru. Said, you put your ener energies there and make a significant difference in the number of women who are dying in childbirth. And we want to help you with some of the other, that and some other. So they did such a remarkable, they decreased their maternal mortality by 60%. 60%, it was astonishing. And so they asked me if I would go to Peru and, and have a press conference and talk about what they've done, because what they did in Peru, other countries could do. So we did that and understood their overall plan. They said they die, most of them die in childbirth because they don't get to a hospital. They, do, they have the children, numerous children, um, in their homes, and so they built they built clinics all over Peru. So if a woman thought she was pregnant, she would go to that, that clinic with a trained professional and say, yes, you are pregnant, and we could expect to have that child in the middle of January. We want to see you again in two months. Then we'll see you once a month. Then we'll see you until, and when you're ready to give birth, here's the hospital where you'll give birth and here's the person that's going to guarantee your transportation. Unbelievable. It was a complete process. We did that, and we helped them, and we sh also gave a, a, a platform to explain that. And I may jump into something, but I think it's important. While I was there, they asked me to do a press conference. The press conference sat in front of a hospital that said, donated by the Republic of China. And I said, no, I won't make the press conference there. Now, I'll stand over here and, and talk to you about that. We help, and we help the United States for a continuing process. China comes in, builds a hospital, leaves that hospital, trains no workers, and goes on. There's a very big difference. Are you in concerned with the level of China's foreign aid to countries in Africa and so because forth? Because it's really not foreign aid the way we think of it. We have expectations. We say, we'll do this. If you, Here's how we'll help you improve in these different areas. China gives them a loan, builds a bridge, builds a hospital. They have a loan. Then they belong to China. It's a very different situation, completely different. Now, yes, I'm very concerned about it. And Nita, are you? Oh, I agree. And in fact, uh, it's not just a loan, but it's a loan that has to be paid back. And many of these countries really dig themselves into a deep hole. They're so grateful for the help. And then they understand that for the next 5, 10, 20 years, they'll be paying back that loan. So, so Nita, here's a, a 
question for you, given your leadership on this. What's the best way of promoting female education and involvement in government in countries where the role of women in public life has been traditionally and culturally suppressed? Well, it's, first of all, it's not easy because you have to be able to work with the government to ensure that the school is maintained. But we've done it very, very successfully, and in some areas, not as successfully. I remember when Malala came here and we met with her and her father, and you know how she suffered so in her own community. But we have found a group, our nonprofit groups that we fund, uh, or some are privately funded. We work in partnership. And we have had some excellent examples. Look, you're not successful everywhere. But when you can work with the community, establish a school, it's a real great success if then the government works with you and continues supporting that system or school, if it's one school, or a whole educational system. What are your thoughts on that, Kay? I think the girls' schools are very important. If you're in a country where there's such a stigma about working with the United States and working period and being educated, then you have to also protect those girls that are, that are going to school and being educated. And I think that, that still is true. And so the more we go into countries where is, that is that fear, I mean, and legitimate fear, I think that girls' schools are really helpful. How do you find a balance, this is for both of you, how do you find a balance in foreign assistance between expressing congressional interest in legislation and allowing flexibility with the executive branch? Oh, you can answer that. I was leaving it up to you. Right? <laughs> well, I, we can both give you an example okay. that infuriated both Democrats and Republicans. We, it was really just about a month or so ago, I guess, uh, we had been contacting the administration, according to my staff and your staff, on a regular basis as to what was happening to the money that we appropriated for the Northern Triangle. Well, the person who was in charge of it, Mr. Sullivan, wouldn't come in and see us, wouldn't talk to us. Finally, six months, it was six months, when he appeared kind of squeamishly, I think. <laughs> he had to be embarrassed. And the entire subcommittee, Democrats and Republicans, expressed our anger because we know how important investing in, whether it's education or health care or housing or um, government systems, we know how important this money was and is to countries in the Northern Triangle. Well, they decided, or I don't really know whether it was Mr. Mulvaney who decided or the president decided, finally, after six months, that some of the money would go there, but not what we appropriated. Well, we have learned in the bill, we will not say shall, should, we must say must because unless you are very specific, uh, there can be an end run around the will of the Congress. So both Democrats, Democrats and Republicans expressed our unhappiness, our fury with this person, um, and it's hard to know whether it was his decision or a higher up decision, but there have been examples of going around the Congress with this administration which, shall we say, does not make Democrats or Republicans smile. <laughs> We've worked through several administrations. And, and, and one thing is, when you cooperate, when you work together and you decide, here are the goals, then you also work together when it's not being handled the way we think it's being handled. Frankly, this is a big secret, don't tell anyone, but we sort of flew under the radar I don't think anyone realized there were two women heading a committee in for a while, which is fine with us. We didn't think about it either that way. It wasn't that important, but it was important that we'd work together 
and they worked together before. And so setting our goals, knowing and saying, we're going to stick with this and keep making the case uh, is just very important. And we were both very adamant about things. I think part of that was the fact that the administration didn't know that in the funding that we had put together all those years, that we were concerned about those governments too. And some of the presidents that we worked with um, disappeared, one went to prison. Um, so there, there was corruption and problems with the government. So we were very careful in writing, writing that, that we weren't just funding to the country, we're funding to projects. So just a quick follow up to that, Kay. Do we, do we have the right balance in our foreign aid budget between congressional directives and executive agency discretion to spend funds as needed? If not, how can that be fixed? I think we write them with the right balance. I'm sorry. Uh, what is was there that the, question? It's, is there the right balance between congressional directives and executive agency discretion? To, is, you, know, the, you need some discretion in, in the executive branch. Is there enough discretion on spending the funds as needed? And if not, how can that be fixed? As the committee that writes the bill, after a lot of discussion and interaction with the administration, I would say a healthy relationship where there is open discussion uh, with experts at USAID, for example. But when there's no respect for the experts at USAID by some in the administration, that's where you see <laughs> problems. So we've had problems, not with USA. There are some of the most dedicated, experienced people that I've ever met working at USA, and many have left because they're so fed up with this administration. So the problem is with uh, <laughs> some individuals as part of the executive branch who think they know more than we do, more than the professionals at USAID and decide perhaps for political reasons or other reasons that they're going to change the priorities. So we have made our language in this bill very clear. Must, should, not shall. Well, which is stronger. I guess shall's pretty, pretty strong Let me, too. Let's go back. Earlier you asked about um, why people are confused or don't understand foreign mm -hmm. assistance are most importantly think it's much, much, much greater amount of money than it is. And w w several years ago, there was a, a large, large group of Republicans elected at one time. And a lot of them ran against any foreign assistance. Um, and so Eric Cantor and I, it was Eric said, you know, we really need to do some work because they ran against any foreign assistance. So we had meetings with them, and I, one uh, member said, we just throw all that money away. It doesn't do anything. So I did my, you know, this is what we do. And um, he said, all that money, all that money. I said, how much money do you think that we, we do spend on foreign assistance? He said, 30% of our entire budget. And I said, no, no, it's not 30%. It's not 30%. He turned the member next to him. He said, it is, isn't it? He said, you could tell he had no idea. He said, no, I think it's 20. I said, it's 1%. 1% is what we spend for foreign assistance. And here's how we decide where that 1% goes. And here's what we demand of them. And, and he said to me, I said, he said, That's, you're wrong. I said, I write the bill. <laughs> you know, I know what I'm talking about. So, so there, there is a, there is a really disinformation out there. And so I know Ms. Lowe and I both constantly talk about that and talk about what we really get back, why we do it, not just out of the goodness of the spirit, which is part of it, but here's what we get in exchange. We get countries that we work with that are better, that have more opportunities, but we gain from that also. Isn't it the role, too, though, of the, the executive, the man in the Oval Office, woman in the Oval Office, to, um, to make that case to the American public? Well, of course. 
I mean, we should all be, if, if we understand, we should all be making the case. Even though people don't ask, we should say, this is what, so, so for instance, when I go on trips, I talk about where I went, what I learned, uh, I write e-newsletters, I, you know, I make sure that everyone knows, you know, I'm not going just to have a good time. You don't go to Afghanistan to have a good time, yeah. but this is what we're doing, and this is why it's important to, to us. I think Jordan is a perfect example, for instance. Jordan, very, in a very difficult place uh, uh, geographically. And Jordan, when we were, when I was having all those meetings with the women of Iraq, it became so dangerous. They blew up the hotel we were going to, they blew up the hotel where you're staying. And the King of Jordan said, I will provide the security meet in Jordan. On the way to Jordan, we saw a refugee camp that was, I think, 450,000 people now, right, in refugee camps in Jordan. This is what we do with Jordan. This is what Jordan does for the world. How many here, I, in, in relationship to this question I'm going to ask, how many people here know what the MCC is and what it does, Millennial Challenge Corporation? So we don't need to explain it too much. I, I would love to get your perspective on what role that plays and what that has brought to the foreign aid toolkit. Well, I think the Millennium Challenge Corporation has been very effective in showing success. If you can work with a country and provide assistance, train people to be executives that know how to run the country or the company that helps, uh, depending on what the project is, the country or it may be a particular uh, institution and we fund those projects based upon their success so you don't keep funding an idea a project if you can not show tangible success and that is what is built into the criteria of a grantee who is applying for Millennium Challenge account funding and, and Kay is that the most important thing that MCC brings to the table in terms of foreign aid that sort of account, I think you have so. to, yeah. I think so. Mm -hmm. um, We're also teaching countries, they can form their own associations also. They form an association with us and a, and a continuing kind of a contract of how we work together. But then they, they do it, it's probably a poor comparison, but I did this with my children. Let me show you what you need to do. Now, did that work? And it's sort of that thing, and I think that's, we, that it is, We've made an enormous impact all over the, all the world. So we're going to do an on-the-ground question and then a higher-up question. Um, what are the unresolved issues in the House and Senate FY20 foreign aid bills? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> what, what well, are, <laughs> let, let me say this. We, the House, com that means both of us, completed our work in June, June. Senator Shelby and I and Pat Leahy and Kay Granger, the four of us, have a very cooperative relationship. However, I do believe that Senator Shelby was waiting for some directive from the White House before they could even begin. So gradually they are beginning. Uh, there are four bills, I think, coming to the floor. But we haven't, I won't get into gobbledygook like 302Bs, you don't have to know about that. We haven't agreed on the basics because Senator Shelby, who really wants to work together in a cooperative way, has to get sign off from the White House and there have been, I assume, some difficulties in doing that. So here we are, we have a CR, a continuing resolution, to November 21st. We're approaching that date, and I'm always an optimist, so I'm hoping that we'll be able to sit down, work out our differences, agree on some numbers, because before you move forward, you have to have agreement on basic numbers. Uh, I will say Kay and I and Pat, Senator Pat Leahy and Senator Shelby have an excellent relationship, um, but I assume you need to get sign off from the White House and that can be a stumbling block. Shall I leave it at that? So that actually, <laughs> so that, that sort of tumbles the question your way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
one thing I think, I sort of talk in stories, but this, is, this is, was important. When the government shut down, and you all saw it on television, you saw people, you know, that right before Christmas, you know, they've charged some Christmas presents, they get their, their credit card, and they're not working, they're not paid, federal employees. When that happened, then the president said, give me a border bill that we can agree on and, and stop the sh he stopped the shutdown and named four of us, the four that Mrs. Lowy just talked about, to put the bill together that he could sign and reopen the government and not have it shut down again. That was really important. It gave us three weeks to do that massive bill. It took a week to figure out how we're gonna do it. We get together and the first question was not, how much do we do for this or that? The first question was, for the four of us, what is the most important thing we do? And the agreement of all of us is we keep from having another shutdown. When you decide that that's the most important thing, because that's the most important thing for the American people, and we all agreed that, and then I think it was Senator Shelby said, we can do this because we're negotiators. Appropriators, authorizers write the bill. We have to find the money. So we negotiate both with departments on issues and together House and Senate. We negotiate. So we negotiated a bill that we could all agree on and the president would sign to keep from having another shutdown. That was really important. But I think, Ms. Lowy, you're the one that said the most important thing is not to have sh a, another shutdown. And it did, it changed the whole... Changed the dynamic, yes, yeah. It changed the dynamics and the way we approach that. And I, I wanted thought to that get, was extremely important. That is, it's a very good point. And um, Nita, I want to just go back quickly to Afghanistan, because this is an important question from uh, someone in our audience. I've been in Afghanistan for 15 years and the situation is worse than ever. What are the strategies to protect women and children going forward? Who is that person who's been there for 15 years? Right I would there. love, you I would love yeah. your advice on that. Maybe you can help us because mm -hmm. I feel very strongly uh, that we cannot just leave. I, I was more optimistic probably than I should have been uh, that the leadership provided by Ashraf Ghani would be more successful uh, because of his experience. But I guess there were too many forces undermining him and his ability to run the country. Um, so I'd be very, I mean, we have provided uh, resources, we have troops. I can't imagine that we can just leave uh, because there would probably be a slaughter and a reversion to what was before. But I would love that person to share with the audience what you think we can be doing to be more successful. Or since we're running out of time, um, I think that's an open invitation for you to come visit them on Capitol Hill and seriously, and talk about it. They're, they're looking for solutions. Thank you. Let okay. me just say one other thing. We, it can't be just military. It can't be just building schools. Uh, we have to deal with the narcotic issues. We have to deal with the other countries who are undermining positive leadership. So it, it's very frustrating and very upsetting to those of us who work so hard to try and bring some stability <laughs> to educate the girls. So I don't have all the answers. And or I think even I think that's a, that's a serious invitation. So take yeah. them up on it. Um, we're running out of time. And um, by the way, I wanted to note how many of these cards said to both of you, "Thank you so much for your service. Thank you." Um, thank you. And I'd like to end on this question to both of you. In light of the present schism within the country politically, what do you think can be done to bring the sides together on key issues affecting global security and the United States position in the world? What can be done to educate the US public about the importance of foreign aid and how little is spent annually from the larger budget? Issues we've touched on, um, but if you could just spend, again, we're about out of time, but briefly touch on 
um, that the foreign aid issue in the broader context of bringing bringing us together again on, on global security issues. Okay. I'll make it very brief. Do things like this. So people that have done it can talk about it. That's what I, that's why I said every trip I take, I talk about it, I send out email, I do everything to say this is what I learned. And I think that's important. Well, I just want to thank all of you because you are experienced, you are knowledgeable, you care, you are committed. And I just think we can't give up because we both understand. And our generals understand, General Mattis understood and understands that uh, foreign aid is better than bullets. So we have to continue to work to educate and to make sure that there's support on both sides of the aisle for foreign aid, as there is in our committee. There's Democrat support and Republican support, and we work very well together on the committee. So <laughs> Congresswomen, I want to thank you both for your service, but also for your spirit of bipartisanship and working thank together you. across the aisle and protecting foreign aid, which is so important to the safety of our security of our country. Thank you, thank you.